Imagine, if you will, you're in a coal mine, working, working in a coal mine. <laughs> That's where John was on the island of Patmos when he received this revelation, which he's going to write down and send to the seven churches. I never forget when I was in the service one time, they uh, told me to go in to this one place where I had to shovel coal. And uh, I was shoveling away and I was shoveling one place, taking it to another place. And this old black guy was there and he told me, he says, Manny, you can work two ways. You can work hard or you can work smart. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, what you're doing is you're going to your work rather than bringing your work to you. And, and then he began to show me how to work smart. And I learned something really valuable back then. But the other thing I wanted to say is working in coal is a nasty thing. It's a lot of dust. If anybody from West Virginia or been around coal mines or been deep inside there or in quarries, then you know how dusty and all that. I'm sure they didn't have protected masks and all that back in those days. They might have worn a scarf or something. But it's a nasty business. John is not a young guy anymore. He's on the island of Patmos. And while he's there, he's going to be taken to paradise. And he's going to see some amazing, amazing things. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, before I get there, uh, I, I put a little post yesterday about prayer for y'all to pray about me to find another uh, place to live. My lease runs out next month. Uh, you know, the rent has gotten so high. Uh, if I continue this way, eventually I'm going to run out of what little savings I have. Okay. I don't make much. I get a, about 600 a month in Social Security. That's it. Okay. So... If, uh, every now and then I'll do some side jobs and all that to try to help my income. Uh, I want to continue to do Bible ministry. The only, uh, I, I plan to finish at least the book through Revelation. Uh, but if it gets too low, then I have no choice but to go back and work. But then I won't have time to do this. And I, and I really want to do this at this point in my life. So pray that I can find something that I can afford and uh, that will give me peace of mind to at least cover uh, what bills I have. I have absolutely no debt uh, whatsoever, except what my current monthly expenses. So I'm thankful for that. My health is okay. I'm playing a lot of tennis and golf when I can, and, and that keeps me pretty healthy, okay? So be praying about that. Uh, you know, ideally it would be nice if I could find like a little building with a classroom in it, and that way I could also not only teach, but have like a little Bible study and church setting there as well. And oh, I don't need much. I got a couch, um, a couple, a bed, a dresser, and that's it. You know, what few things I have here. I don't need much. You know, at this point in my life, I don't want a whole lot. Uh, just enough to get by and, you know, uh, washer and dryer to wash my clothes. and uh, That's it. Okay. Enough of that. Okay, let's get into let's get into Revelation chapter one, verses uh, nine to twenty. We already covered uh, verse one to eight, and uh, we were introduced to the book and the purpose and everything. So now we got. Let me show you the map here. I drew a little map here, so you can kind of vision it, visionary it in your mind, imagine it in your mind. Uh, John is on the island of Patmos. That's in the Aegean Sea. Uh, it's just north of kind of of the Mediterranean. Israel is south. And if you know, remember the stories of uh, Paul's missionary journeys on how he went up and established and planted churches and come back. And he had three different missionary journeys. But he's on the island of Patmos, which is not too far from Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor is the location of the seven churches that uh, John is going to write to. Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamon, Philadelphia, and the last one, Laodicea. 
Okay, why did number seven? Again, as I shared, it could be, it's a number of completion, it's a number of fullness, but we do know that these were seven uh, real churches that Paul established, okay? And so John is on this island, and he's on this island working in a coal mine. Now, if you notice here, I pose some questions. Who, where, why, and when? When you come to the Bible, we want to discover what's there, not invent what's there. Okay? And so we go to a three-step process. It's called observation, interpretation, application. Observation is we're asking the question is what is there? And we can pose a lot of questions. Who, what, why, where, when, how come, and all these other things. They're just a, a, a questions that kind of probe the facts. Interpretation is a whole other thing. That is, what does this mean? Okay? And in the book of Revelation, we have a lot of symbolism, okay? So we got to give interpretation. Now, also in the book of Revelation, it not only gives the symbol, but its interpretation. We don't want to miss that, okay? Worst thing we could do is invent something and make it say something that it really doesn't. That's why we got to have a lot of integrity, especially when we're working with the book of Revelation, to make it only say what God intends it to say. There are going to be situations where we don't know. We can speculate, and we need to say that, as I'm going to do here with some, but we really are not certain, okay? God has left that for himself. Okay, then we get to application. Application is when you're simply saying, okay, now how do I apply this to my life today? And you can't hardly go to the Bible without getting something out of it where God can, uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, open your eyes to some truth where you can make it applicable for today, whether it has to do with yourself, when it has to do with others, your situation. I think about my situation all the time, okay? And so I pray, even as John is on the island of Patmos, God still provided for him. John didn't end up dying on Patmos, okay? He ended up being allowed later on, not, not too much later after he wrote this, to go back to... Ephesus, okay? Now, let's look at some of the questions. First of all, who? Let me read to you this section, then we're going to answer these questions. Remember, you get a blessing for hearing, okay? For doing, and uh, for reading this. So, let me read it, and listen to it so you can get a blessing. Okay, I, right, John your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because, and pay attention to that word, of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstand was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His Head and hair were white like wool, wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. 
I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, so there we got an introduction of the divine, glorified Christ who looks totally different than the way he's portrayed by Hollywood and a lot of hippies and all that. But we also see a description of what Jesus wants John to write about. Okay, fascinating book. I can imagine if I was John, and here I was in this cold mine, and all of a sudden I'm in paradise, and I'm seeing Jesus for the first I probably would have fell down, uh, you know, on the ground too. I probably would have covered my head. <laughs> but you, you could imagine, just you got to get into the atmosphere of what was happening. Now, atmosphere is an observation you can make that's not actually written into the book, but you have a sense of it. Good preachers and teachers have a way of bringing and making that alive. Okay, so John was there, probably covered in coal and all that stuff, and all of a sudden, he's in paradise. Okay, let's go back. Who? His brother and companion in suffering and the kingdom and patient endurance that, and the key thing I want to emphasize is this, that are ours in Jesus. When you become a Christian, you're going to have troubles and you're going to have struggles. It seems like the older you get, the more they come. But why? Because you can carry more. Not like when you were younger, you know, the first struggle, oh God. I mean. But as you get older, you learn to carry more and more and more. It's a story in, in India about they put a little weight on a small baby ox because he can't carry what the mother can carry. But as the ox gets bigger and stronger, they increase the weight. And that's what God does with us, okay? He increases the weight and the load that we carry to the point where we come to the point where we say, Lord, I can't carry this. You carry it for me. See, God has to break us down to that. Okay? Jesus says, come and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my weight is light. Transferring it. So John learned to do. Okay? So he's describing who he is to the seven churches. Hey, I'm one, of, I'm one just like you. Where is he at? He's on the island of Patmos. And he, and he says here, he says, uh, was on the island of Patmos. Why? Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Who, where, why? The testimony of Christ. He was there because he was exiled for witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever been exiled? You ever been put out of a job because of your testimony? You ever been put out of a school? Uh, recently they uh, arrested a young boy in Canada uh, because uh, he said that boys are boys and girls are girls. And this was in a Catholic school, mind you. And they arrested him for saying that. Can you imagine? We live in such a time as that, where standing for even basic, common sense truth will get you arrested, okay? Yet, if you're a Christian, we have much more deeper truth than that, you know? Because even as man is created in God's image, we understand we are made up of, of both tangible and intangible things, you know? We got a tangible body, right? But we have intangible uh, consciousness, spirit, soul, 
And we learn in ways that the world cannot understand because we, we learn not only in what they call uh, epistemology through experience or through science, but we also learn through our spirit and through the Word of God, which is revelation, which is what this is. God telling us that which we would otherwise not know. Okay, so he's on the island of Patmos. He's there because, and he makes it really clear, because of his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has also made it clear to the seven churches, hey, I'm a brother just like you, okay? And I'm, here I am, and, and I've gotten this vision, and God has wanted me to write this to you. And what's the command? The command is to write and send. And he says this, he says, uh, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice with a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Tyrathera, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay. He was in the spirit. <laughs> a lot of people have funny ideas of what does it mean to be in the spirit. Let me ask you something. Are you in the spirit right now? Am I in the spirit? Body, soul, spirit. What is spirit? Okay, it's the Holy Spirit in me, which he sealed. When I put my trust in Christ, he came and sealed me. I'm in the spirit right now. John was in the spirit right now. It's when you're in the spirit that you receive input from the Lord, from his word. Okay, he did it in a special revelation. Okay, which has ceased since the Bible has completed. And that's why there's a warning at the end. Okay, we don't get visions like that anymore. Okay, people, oh yeah, I got this vision from God. And then it doesn't come true. You know, and, and, and God made it really clear. Don't add to this book or you're going to receive the plagues of this book. Okay, and they will. Maybe not in this life, but when they stand before God someday, they're going to lose out. Okay, and now... So he's in the Spirit. What does that mean? Again, he's in the Spirit. That when, when the Holy Spirit comes in us, he fills us day after day after day, unless we have unconfessed sin in our life. No, Holy Spirit is still there, but you're out of fellowship. And that's why in 1 John it says, if we confess our sins, he's just and righteous to forgive us our sins, and it cleanses from all life. Fellowship is restored. It's simple. It's just common sense. No different than your sons or daughter. If they're out of fellowship, they can mom, dad, I'm sorry. And they may, you restore that. You're back, you're back in the right relationship. Okay, now, here's the thing that we cannot be absolutely dogmatic about. On the Lord's Day, you have different interpreters, different scholars that will say that... It, it, one thing they do say is that it was not the Sabbath. Okay, the Sabbath of all the Ten Commandments was altered in the New Testament. Okay, we don't honor the Sabbath like they did in the Old Testament to keep the Mosaic law. It was altered in the sense that the Lord's day was no longer just on a Saturday, but it was every day. And that's why Jesus told the woman at the well, there's coming a day where people will worship me in spirit and truth, not in a location or a specific time and day, but all the time. Okay, so it was changed. So some people think he was referencing the Lord's Day in terms of Sunday being a day for rest. Uh, I don't think that was it. Other people, other interpreters think, ah, oh, the Lord's Day, that's the day that he sets up the Millennial Kingdom. And that's on reference to that time. Okay, here's the thing. He was on the Lord's Day. Whether you believe it to be a specific day of the week or every day, or it was that particular time in the future, it doesn't really alter the meaning. The point was God was sovereign over that time. Okay, so again, where the Bible is not absolutely clear, don't be dogmatic about it, you know? But you can make suggestions. Okay, so he says he's on the Lord's day, and he was on the Lord's day, and he was given this command to write and send to the seven churches. Then he sees a description 
of the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. So apparently he had to turn. He heard it behind him. And the first thing he sees is seven golden lampstands. Picture that if you will. Okay? Golden. Okay? Not iron, not bronze, but golden lampstands. And among the lampstands, among this material thing, was someone like a son of man. That's an interesting description of Jesus, okay? Because it also describes his humanity when he took on humanity uh, when, when he was born of a virgin and he came on the scene on earth. He says, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest, okay? His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. You know, you see an old man with white hair and all that. And what is that? It's, old, it's, it's, it's a description of wisdom, okay, of, of a statue of reverence. That's what I visualize here. His head were white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes. Look in his eyes like blazing fire. Okay, now... When you see the word like, it didn't say the word is. It said it was like that. So you remember John on the island of Patmos, he has to describe things he has never seen before based on things he has seen. He's got to describe the unknown with the known. So bear in mind that. You've got to go back to 95 AD and getting John shoes on the island of Patmos, seeing things you've never seen before and giving it some kind of description. Okay, he says his feet were bronze glowing in a furnace. Man, that's pretty bright. If you've ever been next to uh, a, a smelter, I have, and, and it is incredibly hot. Okay, and the brightness that comes out of these uh, things. I mean, one of my first jobs I ever had, I think I was 15 years old, I was working in the die cast factory. I lied about my age. I had run away. Uh, I was in um, La Puente, California, and I got a job in this die casting factory next to these hot, hot uh, smelters that would burn away all the, the crust and, and impurities and certain metals that I had to put in this thing. And so you can imagine how bright his feet were. It says they were glowing like in a furnace and his voice like the sound of a rushing water. Picture that in your mind. Listen to it. Close your eyes and hear Jesus' voice like the sound of a rushing I, I recently posted a video when I was traveling about, I was next to a waterfall and rivers, you know, and I can hear the beautiful sound as the water going out and picture Jesus' voice coming out. You have a different description of him here than in the Gospels, don't you? Okay? You want to give an accurate description of the Lord Jesus Christ? you got to go to the book of Revelation. Okay? As he is now. Not as he was when he was walking in Galilee. Okay? His voice like the sound around. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Now, he must have an awfully big hand to hold seven stars. Okay, so I can picture that. And out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. Now, you know that's a sword that was used by the Roman gladiators because, uh, well, when they went to fight, first the sword was just pointed, okay? Then they stabbed with that. And one guy got the idea, well, I think I'll sharpen one side. He stabbed and he cut with that side. Now, somebody else came along and says, well, let me sharpen the other side. Now I can stab and slice all kind of ways. Well, the Bible is described as a double-edged sword of God. It pierces the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It understands and cuts through all your rationalization, your compartmentalization, all the false things of the world and everything, and it reveals who you really are to yourself. Okay? And it tells the truth. Okay. His face will like the sun shining in all its brilliance. You look at the sun, man, you have to turn right away. 
Okay, your eyes will burn out. Uh, but you can imagine John seeing Jesus like this for the first time. And John had seen Jesus as he's, when he was on earth, because he was with him for three years, doing his public ministry. John even rested his head on him. And now he's seeing him in a whole different light. What happened to John when he saw him? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. I mean, he couldn't even move. He probably wasn't even breathing. Okay? And then he placed his right hand. Oh, man, I can't even. I can't even imagine me seeing Jesus right there, me falling down, and him putting his hand on me. I wouldn't let him go. I, I can even say when, when he told that woman after he had rose from the dead, he said, let me go. I haven't ascended yet. She won't let him go. When you're with Jesus, you don't want to let him go. But you don't have to wait until he's physically present in front of you. He's, he's with you right now. Don't let him go. Just in your mind and in your arms, reach around, grab him, don't let him go. And you don't have to say anything, just like John, like he was dead. And Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead. You know that, John. You saw that. And behold, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Haiti. God is sovereign. You think these presidents and these different head of states and all that, they think they're so arrogant and all their promotion of evil and all that, you don't think that God doesn't take notice of all that and someday he's going to deal with them in a just way? He will. He's sovereign. And when this happens, it's going to happen suddenly. So John is there, he's looking up at Jesus. And Jesus says to him, John, I want you to do something for me. Write therefore what you've seen. And this is the key verse to all of Revelation. It's the divine outline to understanding the book. Okay? It has to do with three tenses. Write therefore what you've seen. That's past. That's going to be chapter 1. Write therefore what is now, that's present. That's going to be chapters 2 and 3. And what will take place later, that's chapters 4 to the end of the book, chapter 22. So he gives him this divine outline, then he introduces him to some symbols. And he's going to tell him what those symbols were that he first saw. He says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Who were the angels? Were they actual angels or were they the pastor of this church? I'll answer that question when we get into the next uh, chapters 2 and 3 where John is actually going to write to the seven churches a message from Jesus specifically to each one. Here's what I want you to think about today. Imagine Jesus the way John just described him. Just described him. And picture his attributes and know that someday you're going to have the same visual image of the Lord Jesus Christ as John did over 2,000 years ago. And this Jesus knows what's going on in your life and he's watching you 
and he has a plan for your life and a purpose and he's got his hand on you and he's telling you not to be afraid. God bless y'all. Y'all have a great day.